This past week, I was able to join uh, the uh, golf fellowship at Dunes West, and, and we played on Tuesday afternoon. And, and we get out, and we're playing. We're having a good time, and, and it's a uh, you know great company. It was a uh, beautiful time of the year as the temperatures actually start coming down, and as we're able to enjoy being outside. And, and I, I'm not playing particularly great, which was a little frustrating, but I was like, well, at least I'm with good company. And so I kept kind of trying to, uh, to, to think in positive terms because I find myself being a little bit too competitive on the golf course. And we come to one hole, and, and it's a beautiful hole. It's number seven at Dunes West, and it's a long hole. And, and this hole's kind of given me problems in the past, so I'm already standing up there, and I have all these bad thoughts and bad energy going through me. I hit a, a very, very good drive for, by my standards. And, and as I'm driving and we're looking around for some other balls, I start thinking, you know, I have this, this shot. It's a par five. I don't know if any of you play golf. And, and so a par five uh, is the longest of the holes. And, and I realize that I actually can hit this green in two. And I'm going to have to use a long iron, which is uh, you can hit it the, the farthest out of the irons but it's a really hard iron to hit. You either hit it well or you hit it terribly. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I have this chance to actually be able to do something with my round, but I have to hit a club that I really don't like to hit. And, and I start thinking about all these bad memories of me hitting it to the left, me hitting it to the right, and I start thinking, I'm really going to waste this drive because I'm kind of the best at wasting a good drive. But all of a sudden, as I pull up to my ball, I look, and, and, and I see the green. And I remember a couple, about a month ago, I would played this same hole, and I had had the same club, and I would actually hit a decent golf shot. And so I, I, I remember seeing the ball flying in the air, and I remember seeing it landing on the green. And, and so I step up, and I think golf is one of the only sports that when you talk about it, you actually kind of do the motion. But, but I step up to the ball. And I have kind of, I start having this good, this, this, this good feeling, like I'm actually going to hit this. And so I then once again look, and I see the ball flying and landing on the green. And so I take my swing, and I pull it back, and I hit it. And I want to know, I won't take a poll, how many of you think I actually hit the ball well on this swing? <laughs> All right, so, so we have a couple. How many think I hit it just okay? Okay, we have a couple. How many of you think I just really choked and hit it terrible? <laughs> I will be praying for you. <laughs> I actually hit one of the best shots of my life. Oh. <laughs> I missed the putt, though, so uh, <laughs> I need you all to pray for my putting. But um, I remembered that good shot, and there was power in that remembrance. That me remembering that I could actually hit a shot good had some power. That that previous moment, that when I had hit the ball well, that being able to remember that changed me. It changed my attitude, it changed my thinking, and in a sense, it enabled me to hit my shot. And when Paul writes, do this in remembrance of me, that when Jesus is gathered around his disciples, that the remembrance he's talking about is remembering the power of that moment. But it's also another dimension. It's recognizing that the power in that moment is presence. Present. And uh, one of my favorite Greek words is used in this moment. I, I usually don't talk about Greek a whole lot. But it's the word anamnesis. And we translate it remembrance. But, but really, the, the best way to wrap our mind around it is that what we're remembering, that it is present, that it is powerful, and that it is changing the moment in which we are partaking in. And so as I was changed, that day, and just slightly for the better before I miss the putt. But we believe that as we gather around the Lord's Supper, as we gather around the risen Christ's table, that we are changed. That when Jesus took 
the bread. And when Jesus took the wine, that he said that this is my body and that this is my blood. That coming to the Lord's table is more than a symbol. That coming to the Lord's table is gathering around the power of God. And what is the power that resides at this table? It's remembering that God gathered around the table with his disciples. And it was on the night in which he was betrayed. It was on the night in which he knew that within 24 hours he was going to be hanging on a cross. That he was going to be taking his last breath. That the people in which he had become best friends with were going to betray him. He knew that Judas was going to turn him over. He knew that Peter was going to deny him three times before the cock crowed. He knew that the other disciples would flee from him, that they didn't want anything to do with Jesus, the moment in which he was being taken to Golgotha. And for me personally, I find a lot of comfort in knowing that God is still willing to share God's grace with us, even when God knows that we're going to turn our back on God that we're going to do things that cause God pain, that we're going to turn our back on one another. But Jesus still willingly says, this is my bread. This is my body. This is my wine, which is my blood. That these are my gifts to you, so that you may be nurtured, and so that you may be strengthened in my spirit. Because I don't know about you, but I know about myself that I come to worship on Sunday seeking to be strengthened, seeking to be renewed and refreshed, seeking to to gain a foretaste of God's heavenly banquet. Because it's hard to go from day to day. Living's not easy. And, And being a disciple of Christ is very challenging. But to know that the God who created the world It's the God who gave us these gifts. And so Jesus is willing to offer these to us this day because this is the new covenant. Jesus is in continuity with the covenants of the old. And a covenant is agreement between God and between God's people. That there's Abraham hanging out in the desert And he's far, far away from Israel. And God comes to Abraham. And God looks at Abraham. And he says, I will be your God if you will be my people. And then God came to Jacob. Someone who who had turned their back on God, who had had stolen the birthright, who, who had cheated his brother, cheated his son, who had fled from the wrath of God and fled from the wrath of Isaac. And God says, if you will be my people, I will be your God. And that God who came to Abraham and to Jacob comes to Moses. And Moses is hiding because Moses, out of anger, had killed someone, had killed an Egyptian, who was hanging out in the desert, hoping that no one would find him. And God comes to him and says, Moses, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And Jesus came to the disciples. Jesus came to the countryside, and he looked at them, and he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And Jesus comes to us today, and Jesus says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. That the covenant of God is a gift that God has given to so many, and that God has given to us. And since the covenant is a gift from God, 
I believe that is why Jesus sat around that table that night, knowing that he was going to be betrayed, knowing that the disciples would turn their back on him. And Jesus looked at them and said, I will be with you. And one way in which I will be with you, in which I will be your God, is I will be with you at the table. That I will be with you in worship. That I will be with you when you call upon my name. And so as we, Point Hope United Methodist Church, celebrate communion this day, we celebrate the gift that God has given us. We celebrate that God is giving God's self to us. But we also celebrate that God is not just giving us love and grace and mercy. That God is giving God's people throughout all of the world grace and mercy. And so as we gather together, we proclaim the oneness in Christ. We proclaim that our identity is as Christians and that we are linked together through the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we gather at this table, we hear Paul's words to us to say that we don't just gather to be made one, but we gather so that we may proclaim the Lord's death. And yesterday I was thinking about our brothers and sisters in China who worshipped earlier today. That those who are worshipping in many provinces are having to sneak into house churches and into churches above warehouses. I, I had a friend whose dad had gone to China and he had worshipped in one of these churches. And he had gone in the front of a, a I think it was a butcher shop, and he had to go up these stairs. And that they worshipped God. They worshipped Jesus Christ, knowing that they could be arrested. And I was thinking about our brothers and sisters in Saudi Arabia and in Afghanistan and in the war-torn countries and the predominantly Islamic countries, that they are worshiping God today, that they are worshiping Jesus Christ, and that they know that they could become martyrs for Christ, but they know the importance of gathering at the table. I was thinking about our brothers and sisters in Africa who are starving with the, the, the hunger that is happening over in those countries, especially in Somalia. But they still are celebrating God's goodness. And they're gathering around the table to be fed by God. And in all of those countries, they don't just stay at the table and leave. They are leaving to proclaim that Christ has died. That many times we kind of get down on ourselves in America because the church is dwindling. That we see the, the numbers each and every year are going down. But today is a day to rejoice because as we look throughout the world, the church is booming. The church is growing more than we could imagine in China. The church is growing more than we could even ever imagine in Africa that the church is booming in South America, that God is up to something great, that there is a great spiritual awakening happening in this world. And we come together as a world this day saying, God, as we come to this table, may there be a spiritual awakening in our own lives, in our own communities. May we actually be empowered to go out and to proclaim that Christ has died. To proclaim that Christ is risen. To, to, to look at everyone. And, and to have a sense of urgency that we have been given the good news. And that there are people who are perishing. That who are dying without knowing God's love. And so Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And, and there is a sense of urgency that we don't know when Christ is coming again. We don't know when our day will be the last. And so we must hurry, and we must share the good news. And so as we come today, I pray that the power of God's grace 
will change us. I pray that God's grace seeps into our very being. And that we, as God's church, Point Hope United Methodist Church, will be changed once again. And that we will be sent forth to proclaim Christ has died. That we will be sent forth to teach people that God has a gift for everyone. That God will be their God. And that we will be God's people. And all of the church said, Amen.